How many of you came for the word? Raise your hand if you came for the word. How many of you came for a joke? I don't have any. Joke's on you. Okay, open your Bible. Now, the joke is really in the title. But there ain't nothing funny about this message. Now, it may be funny in how to deliver it. I don't know. Uh, If I were to mention Joseph, you would immediately think from the pit, Potiphar's, to the palace, right? Prison, even throw prison in there. But tonight, we're going to take a totally different approach. And we're going to talk to you about from the palace to the poorhouse. See, I'm letting that rapport just build. See, rapport, uh, in public speaking, this is public and I'm speaking, you're supposed to do something that causes people to immediately connect. And I, I just felt, I felt an overwhelming connection because I know y'all are excited about going from the palace to the poorhouse. And that's why I named it uh, this title. is because I want, I want you to stop and realize you're already in the palace. Most people, when they study the book of Job, they really dig into those first 41 chapters. Oh, boy, we can relate to to all the stuff and the pain and the agony and the gloom and the despair and the attack and the frustration and the irritations and people that come alongside to, quote, encourage his three wonderful friends, even his wife who said, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? Whoo, that's a marriage right there. And, and, and what a lot of people fail to do is bother to read the last few verses of chapter 42 and see that Job was not only restored what he lost, but double what he had. But tonight, we're going to start from this perspective. We are in the palace. We're heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. He withholds no good thing from those who walk uprightly. What can we learn in the first chapter of Esther that will keep us from going from the prince or princess, children of God, and end up in the poorhouse. So, let's take a look at it. There's a queen of the kingdom. Her name is Vashti. And I have taught on Esther probably in my ministry. This would be the third time, I think. May only the second time. I think it's the third time. But tonight, we're not speaking specifically on Esther. One thing I want you to stop and think about as you study Esther with me, as we do what you call expository teaching, and that's verse by verse. Everybody say, oh my, Uh verse by verse. As we look at this, I want you to pay close attention that God is never mentioned in the book of Esther. Have you ever been going about your life, your Christian life, and you had to deal with life as it was coming at you. And you wonder, where is God? I mean, we like the burning bush stories. We like God showing up in angelic manifestation. We like God being a big six or nine foot angel with a sword and a shield and glowing, you know. We like those, and I I like those. But in Esther, God's never, he, he's never mentioned. So here's what I want you to consider as we look at Esther, because what we don't see is God's name mentioned, but what we do see, if you bother to really take time and study it and, and meditate on it, is you see God working behind the scenes. Now listen to me. The reason that's important is because a lot of times in our lives, we want these physical, glorious manifestations, but just because you don't feel God doesn't mean He is not there. And so what we will see as we study Esther is God is continually moving behind the scenes. But let's not talk about Esther. Let's talk about you. You understand God is positioning you. He is moving things as the as the grand chess master of the cosmos. He is moving things and you For his divine purpose. So let's see what we can learn. Because what we find in this book. At least what God's showing me in this study of this book. Is that you've got the queen that goes from the palace to the poorhouse. And the orphan 
It goes from basically her cousin's poor house, she ends up in the palace. So since we're children of God, I want us to look at this from the perspective, kind of odd really, to think of us looking at it from the perspective of the queen who's already in the palace, so that we don't get exiled to the poorhouse. Can I just give you the Bible term, the Christian terminology? Backslide. Uh, so let's just take a look at it. So let me lay some groundwork here. You say, I thought you did. 1 Corinthians ten twelve. Wherefore, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Would you consider going from the palace to the poorhouse? Falling? <laughs> Backsliding? How about this one? Psalm 75, 5. Lift not up your horn on high. Speak not with a stiff neck. Now, what's that sound like to you? Exalting yourself? Unteachable? For promotion comes not from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south, but God is the judge. He puts down one. Who would that be in this story? Vashti. And he exalts another. Who would that be in the book? That'd be Esther. So, when I'm looking at this, I'm going, well, what was going on in Vashti's life that somehow caused her to get exiled from being, uh, living in the palace? What, what was in her life? How did, what, how did number one, how did she get to be queen? Why was she queen? And what was going on in her personal thinking or life or her attitude that caused her to be exiled? Humility. Are you ready? Everybody say humility. Does that have a silent H? Humility is a, uh, in various interpretations is widely seen as virtue, which centers on low self-preoccupation or an unwillingness to put oneself forward so that in many religions and philosoph philosophical traditions, it contrasts with narcissism, hubris, and other forms of pride. Have you figured out what Vashti's problem is yet? Have you, did I give you a hint? What was the issue that the queen had that caused her ultimately to exile? Here it is, right here. But now, humility, I want you to listen carefully to this description of humility. In a spiritual context, humility can mean a recognition of self in relationship to God. I'm going to let you think about that for a moment. Because that may be more deep, more deep. It could be more deeper or it could just be deeper. Listen to this description. In a spiritual context, humility can mean a recognition of self in relationship to God with subsequent submission to God. Now, when I read that, I read that through the lens of my Christian experience. Let me just give you a real quick. In 1983, ORU, Tulsa, Oklahoma, the youth conference, everybody's on our face. We're worshiping the Lord. The power of God's moving. And something happened in my life. Again, I've told you, I, don't, I, I can't explain it, but what I felt like happened because I was young, I was seeking the will of God, I was pursuing God, still am, but zeal without knowledge, and I had enough knowledge to be dangerous. But what I felt like was that God had done something monumental in my life and I felt this big. I felt small. I didn't feel big. I, had the, I was in the presence of God. It was a, what an experience. But instead of feeling, wow, I felt small. I felt like I, I, I've described it as I'm sitting on a, on a big tall stool and my feet won't even touch the floor. I'm just so little. And it really had an impact in my life. I still believe it, that impact has been imprinted in my spirit. Now, so let me explain this description again. In a spiritual context, humility can mean recognition of self in relationship to God. Now, what I just described, in relationship to God, He is God. And I'm, my feet won't even touch the floor. But it's more than that. That's the essential seed of humility. 
But this is what people don't understand in the church and the world. When you have this revelation of how small you are and how big God is and how this God is your God and you're his kid, I'll finish the sentence, with subsequent submission to God. Therefore, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You are not my source. You're my partner, my co-laborer, my friend. I'm just as little as you are. But we are big in God, and God in us is big. Don't tell me it can't be done. You tell me something can't be done, oh, you're going to see a side of me of humility that people don't understand. They think it's arrogance. They think it's pride. They think it's boastful. But you know what it is? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because anything I do that's not through Christ who strengthens me is wood, hay, and stubble. It's worthless. It's consumed. But I can do all things. Hence, all these years we're still doing things. Why? Because we know we can because God is big. And the problem is when people, if you start telling people what God's doing in your life and what he's done in your life and how he's blessed your life, They'll call you a braggart. Well, you're just arrogant. Listen, I don't even tell you all the wonderful things God's done in my life. It blows me away. And I've been doing this for 40-something years. So when you start sharing those kind of personal things, people say, oh, now you've really done it. So I want you to notice that, that humility in a spiritual context can mean recognition of self in relationship to God, which means we realize how dependent we are upon Him. In Christ we live, in Him we live and move and have our being. But because of that, we submit to Him, and when He gives you a marching order, you know what you do? You march. Have you ever considered a Christian education for your child? Then you should check out Arkansas Christian Academy, Saline County's fully accredited premier Christian school at an affordable family rate. Students have opportunities to excel in academics, athletics, fine arts, and technology. And through our dual enrollment program, high school students can even achieve an associate's degree prior to graduation. Visit us at ArkansasChristianAcademy.org. So my point is this. When God gives you a marching order, if you're humble, you march. You march. That's why you've got to live prepared. The Boy Scout motto, Ms. Arp, is what? Be prepared. What happens, though, is we don't realize we're being prepared right now. What I'm teaching you right now, you're going to be able to use. There will be a test. I'm not passing out one. The devil takes care of that. You're going to be tested on whether or not you've heard it and are willing to do it. Or are you just a hearer? So, now what is pride? It's a ne in a negative connotation, pride refers to a foolish and irrational corrupt sense of one's personal value. Now, I've said this before, and I'm going to say it again. I love Dave Ramsey. We're going to start a, a series in some form or fashion here on financial freedom. I love Dave Ramsey. I tell you, I was Dave Ramsey before Dave was Dave. And Dave will always say, I don't deserve it. And I'm going to tell you something. I don't know what he's saying, but because you're a child of God and Jesus died and rose again, sent the Holy Spirit, he made you deserving. Not the old you, but the you that you have given to him. He, we give him our life, basically our death, and because of his death, he gives us his life. You say, well, now, if you think you deserve it, you have pride. No, I don't deserve it because of me. I deserve it because of him. But you see how religion twists our head where we have a false humility. Pride is a negative, in a negative connotation, pride refers to foolish and irrational, corrupt sense of one's personal value. But aren't you proud that you're a child of God? So there's an, a sense of pride or an area of pride that's not negative. Pride, though, that becomes narcissistic and self-centered, totally different. One's personal value, status, or accomplishments used syn synonymously with hubris in Judaism, pride is called the root of all evil. Isn't that interesting? Pride. Oh, let, that, you probably remember this guy. Name fails me. Oh, Lucifer. That's his name. 
Beelzebub. What was his issue? His issue was pride. Romans 12, 3 says this, For I say through the grace, everybody say grace. Man, grace, thank God for grace. Through the grace given to me to every man that's among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. But then he doesn't stop with a period there. Christians do. Preachers often do. But let's read the rest of the Holy Scripture. But to think soberly. What does that mean, to think soberly? Think the thoughts of God. To think the way God does. That makes sense? But to think soberly, how? What is sober thinking? How does that come about? Listen, according as God has dealt to every man, every one of us, the measure of faith. That means we all start out with an equal measure. Is yours growing? But as your faith grows, those who know their God will do exploits. I think it's the book of Daniel. Those who know their God will do exploits. How? Because the only way you can know God is spend time with Him. You've got to spend time in His Word. And you've got to get the Word right. I've had people say, well, you know, I, I've, been, I've been getting in the Word and I'm not getting anything out of it. Listen, the key of getting in the Word is not necessarily or only to get something out of it. Listen to me. It's to get it in you. Can't get it in you if you're not spending time in it. But sometimes if we go to the Word only to see what we can get out of it, it doesn't seem to work right. I want to spend time in the Word. You know, I take my vitamins, look at me. Okay, don't look at me. Just take your vitamins. In other words, if I want to be healthy, I might need to supplement my poor diet. I would hope to think that you do have a diet. You know, everybody, everybody's on a diet. Some of you are just on the wrong one. You know, ice cream has a tendency to pass the lips straight to my hips. I don't know what it is about ice cream. I, I, Sandy, Sandy walked in with a, with a bottle of water, and when she walked by me, Wally was blocking my view, and all I saw was she was holding something like that, and all I saw was the white cap on the water, and I thought she had ice cream. I said, Sandy, you got ice Oh, never mind. Ice cream. Now, how many of you are thinking ice cream now? See, the thing is, it's possible that some of you don't feed well, nourish yourself well individually, daily, taking your, quote, your supplements. So what happens, you come here, and we have to give you that booster shot. We've got to come in here with that truckload and just dump it all on you. So the thing I want you to realize is that pride is, is when you think of yourself where you're putting you first all the time humility is others focused humility is not thinking less of ourself I mean I'm a child of God does it get any better than that but it is thinking of myself less in other words I'm putting other people first but that doesn't mean I don't take care of what God's given me to take care of personally all right, so Vashti's pride. We'll look in Esther now, and it says, Now it came to pass the name of the, name of the king. I ain't going to try. I am not even going to try to announce the name of this king every time I see it in the Scripture. You just read it for yourself. Say it out loud. Now it came to, uh, to pass in the day of the king, which reigned from India, even to Ethiopia, over 170 and 20 provinces. Uh, and in those days, the king sat on the throne of his kingdom in Shushan, the palace. And in the third year of his reign, he made a feast unto all his princes. Verse number four, when he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty, many days for even a hundred and four score days. And when these days were expired, the king made a feast. And then later, the queen made a feast. And verse number seven, he gave them drink and vessels of gold. In other words, he's showing off. And based on tonight's message and what I shared Sunday, I want you to notice the pride that keeps popping up in the lives of individuals in this book. Let me just fast forward. Haman. How many of you read Esther? Anybody ever glazed over Esther? There's a guy named Haman. What was his problem? Pride. When I read this book, I immediately see our political structure. 
and our politicians. That if you don't bow down and do what I tell you, listen, we hire them, we fire them. If they don't get that straight, fire them. It's pretty simple. Haman, Haman thought everybody ought to bow down to him. Mordecai wouldn't do it. And what you see in Mordecai, we'll pick this up in chapter 2, is compassion for this orphan cousin. And you see his unwillingness to compromise and bow down to Haman. That's because he is humble. Not because he is proud. It's because he is humble. He wasn't going to bow down to this guy. He's going to bow his knee to God, not to Haman. Do you understand the difference a little bit? Drinking out of gold. I mean, they're having a party. And the drinking was according to the law. Uh, none did compel. And so the king had appointed all his officers of his house. They should do according to every man's pleasure. <laughs> for yourself, for yourself, nobody else. Do your own thing as long as you don't hurt somebody. No man, the Bible says, lives unto himself. Also, Vashti the queen, she made a feast. And on the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine. Stop the presses. I am not even going to preach on that. I'm just going to read it to you again. They've been partying now for seven days. And when the heart of the king was merry with wine. In other words, he is loosey-goosey. He was tipsy. Germans would say he was farouk, crazy. He commanded all these guys, I ain't going to bother reading all their names, uh, to bring Vashti the queen before the king with a crown royal to show the people and the princess her beauty, for she was fair to look on. We have no clue as to how she became queen, but just based on this entire book, we know one of the qualifications to be the queen for this king you had to be a good looking. When my parents divorced, we moved from Jonesboro to Little Rock, and I moved from Annie Camp, where I played football and ran track, and moved to Little Rock, where I did not get to play football. Uh, Y'all have heard the story. And I went from being just a guy at school, I wasn't popular. I was just one of the guys. I was one of the football players, one of the track runners. I, I mean, I, I knew everybody. Everybody knew me, but I wasn't po what you'd call popular. But then I moved to Westside Junior High School, closed down many years ago, down by uh, the Children's Hospital. And all of a sudden, I'm popular. Everybody's talking, oh, Perry, Perry, all the girls are Perry. And I'm, I'm like, what? That is weird. I am the same guy. That was at Jonesboro. And one day I was on the bus with Jerry Sullenberger. His dad was an open heart surgeon, got murdered. One of the earliest pioneers of open heart surgery. And because of the murder, he and his brother ended up at the Methodist home. And we were on the bus. Jerry was a little bit older than me, about a year or so. And we were, had, uh, we, the Methodist home picked up at the school. Then we went over to Southwest. And as we pulled into Southwest to pick up the kids from the home that went to Southwest to the west side, uh, I said, he said, Perry, how's it going? I said, Jerry, it's weird. I don't understand. All the, all the girls are talking about me and writing me notes and all the guys are talking to me. And I said, I'm the same guy that I was in Jonesboro. He said, Perry, don't ever lose that. See, the previous year at Westside, a guy, I can't tell you his name, because his dad was a professional golfer. Uh, and he came to the school at Westside in midterm. And all of a sudden, he was the rave of the campus, 14. And I saw kind of how he acted. You know, what do we call that? Conceited. And Jerry told me on that bus, he said, Perry, don't ever let it get to your head. Now, y'all know y'all looking at me like that because you're wondering, why in the world were you popular? You're not that cute. And that's what I wonder, because I was the same guy that I was before. I didn't get cuter. Matter of fact, my nose got bigger. Hi, Perry Black right here at Destin Wind TV, and I want to invite all of our Christian educators and administrators to join us July the 19th, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. for Stratagos Intruder Response Training. As you well aware, we are living in perilous times, and we must be prepared to protect our staff and students entrusted into our care. Information right there on your screen. Join us for this dynamic training seminar. Until then, God bless you.
But my point is, it would have been easy to have been caught up in pride. In Central High School, I was nominated, I think, for five of the eight senior distinctions. And one of them was most friendly. I was in the top ten for the most handsome in school. We had an ugly senior class. But my point is this. My point is this. A girl on the journalism staff who was responsible for whatever that was, senior distinction stuff, you know, most school spirit, most likely to succeed, all that stuff. Y'all went to school, right? She turned around in homeroom and said, Perry, if you, could, if you could have any of those that you were nominated for, what would it be? I said, most friendly. If I'm handsome or not, I didn't have anything to do with that. You know, like you ladies, I mean, this is what you get. I don't get to put makeup on. They won't do that till I'm in the box. They have put pink lipstick on me, I'll be laying there. Duck lips. He never looks so good. I mean, this is what you get with a guy. And I said, I'd want to be most friendly because I tried to be friendly. I befriended underclassmen. I walked up to them when they wouldn't make eye contact and said, hey. And within months, they were like, who's that crazy guy? Everybody knew me. Not because I was handsome, not because I played football, not because I ran track, but because I noticed them. Hey, church. You know what would happen if we noticed them when they walk in this foyer? Not do they notice you, but we notice them. And they feel significant. They'd want to know you. And so, I accepted the award for being the most friendly because I endeavored to make underclassmen feel valued and important instead of putting my thumb on them. Right? All right, y'all, are y'all still here? Pride... The first principle is this, Vashti, she refused when they sent for her, they refused, she refused to come when the king asked her to, told her to. Man, that was against the law. It's a wonder, it's a wonder they, that they didn't execute her. Pride comes in subtle forms, and it often ends in self-destructive behavior. Hi, I'm Perry Black right here at Destiny to Win TV, and I want to say thank you for watching our program. You know, we'd love to connect with you, and one way you can do that is join us right here at Family Church Bryant on Sunday morning or on Wednesday night. As you well know, we teach straight from the Word of God with a touch of humor to make the medicine go down. You know, we believe here at Family Church, a church alive is worth the drive. And if you're not connected with a local church, then why don't you visit us? Information right here on the screen. Until then, I'll see you right here at Destined to Win TV. God bless.